Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar presented by the Venezuela Solidarity Network, the VSN, titled Breaking Down the Elections, Post-Electoral Violence and U.S. Intervention, following the presidential elections that Venezuela just had on July 28th. As we all know, in these elections, the National Electoral Council, the CNE, declared President Maduro the winner. The far right has since then been trying to delegitimize the elections by claiming fraud and promoting fake news, not to mention attempting a, a coup and violence by armed gangs. Opposition candidate Enlundo Gonzalez and his backer Maria Corina Machado have openly called for the armed forces to overthrow the government. The latest news is that the CNE has turned over the tally sheets, actas, uh, as well as the full results and evidence of the cyber attack to the Venezuela Supreme Court. The court has called on all the candidates to present their actas, which is going to hopefully resolve these uh, claims of fraud. And to help us understand what's going on are Jorge Arriaza, the Executive Secretary of ALBA, Alison Bodine, an activist and elector, election observer, and Andreina Chavez, a journalist for Venezuela Analysis. So we're going to begin with Jorge Arriaza, who has a really incredible depth and breadth of knowledge about the Bolivarian Revolution. He is currently the Executive Secretary of ALBA, the Bolivarian Alliance for the Peoples of Our America. He has been Venezuela's Vice President the Minister for Science and Technology, the Minister for Higher Education, Minister of Communes and Social Movements, among many other positions. He was also Venezuela's foreign minister from 2017 to 2021, which was argu arguably one of the most challenging eras for Venezuelan diplomacy. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Executive Ser Secretary of ALBA, Jorge Arriaza, please. Again. Muchas gracias, Leonardo. Muchas gracias, Code Pink. Thank you very much to Code Pink and all the comrades. Uh, I was willing to do it in English, but I prefer to do it in Spanish. That's much easier for me in order to be able to share the context. Venezuela during the last decades has entered in a process of a new kind of democracy. As people of Venezuela, we chose in 1998 a national project and a project that contemplated calling upon the people in order to make big decisions. What uh, Commander Hugo Chavez, uh, and this uh, turned into a, a very progressive and advanced constitution that um, defines Venezuela as a state, a democratic state of social and justice and establishes that sovereignty resides in the people and opens the paths to the people organized to have the power beyond in the institutions of the state. All this is happening over 3,000 millions of oil barrels, perhaps the most important um, oil reserve in South America, minerals of all kinds, gold, uh, bio, biological diversity, and water reserve reservations. And uh, this new democracy has gone through many um, proofs uh, because what we've experienced in Venezuela in the last years, this is something I want to uh, make very clear, is that all chapters that we've experienced in during the um, Bolivarian uh, revolution is this fight of national uh, bourgeoisie and with imperialism and transnational uh, corporations in order to take over that that power and uh, our resources and then the people struggling to be still in power in 2012 too we had uh, uh, there was a coup that lasted 12 hours, then the referendum during 2004, then the different scenes of violence in the streets, 
of the national bourgeoisie in the streets. They attempt to defraud, to say the defraud of elections, the blockades, the sanctions, the, the attempts of magnicide. All these are part of the long soap opera of, of a historical dispute for the political and economical power in Venezuela. That's why uh, we say this very proudly. We've been able to maintain 30 first 31 uh, elections in 30 years of revolution. Different um, elections, presidential elections in 1998, in the 2000 with a new constitution in 2004 with the attempt of a referendum in 2006 again commander Chavez won in 2009 um, an amendment was proved was approved for a continuous re-election of the president in 2008 um, and in 2013 once then Commander Chavez died, Mr. Maduro won the elections. In 2018, President Maduro uh, won. And in 28 of July, Mr. Uh, Maduro won again. But we've had so many other elections among the 31st of mayors, governors, um, national assemblies, and I'd like to say that we've had approximately uh, an 150,000 elections of communal councils from 2006 up to 2024. The communal council in the territories of the uh, 300 families, they have their own territorial government. They go to a uh, democratic process. Um, they represent a level of government in the territory. This is a democratic participation. And this all exists over the most important um, reserve of oil of this world. That's why the corporations are governing Washington. Today, the real face of our enemy uh, is not Joe Biden. This was shown during these elections. Is not uh, Blinken. Is Elon Musk. Is the corporations, the big lobbies, technological, pharma uh, pharmaceutical, oil, etc., that are governing these countries and they take out and in governments in false democracies and they haven't been able to do that in Venezuela. In this general context, we will talk about the elections of the 28th of July, last Sunday, but I would also like us to value the triumph, the victory of these people after 10 years of consecutive aggressions. We can identify this phase of aggression from the United States uh, and the rest of the cooperative uh, um, governments in 2014 when they decide to uh, stop recognizing the capacities of Venezuela for financing, they wouldn't let us, not even a dollar, the banks of the United States left uh, Venezuela. We weren't able to import any kind of uh, inputs for, that we needed for productive uh, processes. And then in 2015, the unusual threat, uh, the decree of Obama that allowed uh, Donald Trump later on to impose to more than 900 sanctions against the people, especially against the central bank and the state and its capacities and abilities to produce and, in, and import. And as Richard Nephew says, um, Barama, oh, back, um, Barama, Barama um, assessor, 
these measures, these illegal measures are there to create suffering and to direct them to where it hurts us more, the oil, so that we cannot uh, maintain the state and so that the people die of hunger. Uh, with all respect, uh, Mr. Elliot Abram told me, he told me this on the 26th of February on 2019, as Maduro didn't want to give the power to um, Guaido, he even offered me to go to United States with my family and they would give me a luxurious life because we didn't want to give up the country. Well, then you won't have electricity, food, medicine. Um, uh, and when the people cannot stand it anymore, we will go to impose a peace. When the conflict arises, we will bring peace and we will keep the oil, as Trump said. He, he even said it, if he would have continued in power, they would have stolen as a war treasure uh, Venezuelan's oil and they would have the control of the government. In this fight, we arrived to the 28th of July. There was an electoral campaign that de was developed in peace. I don't want to compare uh, Venezuela with other countries, but there was no one single death, not even in a demonstration, in any meeting, in any caravan. Uh, Everything was calm, despite the fact that we were facing uh, a, an imperial agent, Mr. Gonzalez Rutea. He does he doesn't like to be called in one with on his one uh, last name. He's a Washington agent, and the woman that was leading all this, Maria Corina Machado. It's an agent from Washington and the corporations. They didn't only ask for coercive, coercive measurements against Venezuela, but they also asked Venezuela to be attacked, uh, invaded. And they were celebrating when this country, uh, when people were leaving from the country for uh, due to the economic crisis that these sanctions itself created. People that called for um, to kill Maduro, who called him a drug dealer, etc. Honestly, for, for this debate, I believe that in Venezuela, there were no objective conditions to go to an election, democratic elections in this opportunity. It was a country that was uh, oppressed by the sanctions and the aggression we've gone through. In Ukraine, there were no elections. We are also in a war. There are countries that postpone elections for, for any kind of reasons. But Mr. Maduro, or President Maduro, said we will go to elections no matter what, because that's what our constitution um, demands. And the most important candidate of the nine candidates of the opposition was a candidate that was named and supported by the White House and the corporations that govern uh, um, Washington. And during the campaign, there were proposals. Mr. President Maduro expressed its, his proposals and the media, CNN, Fox News, etc., wouldn't transmit the images of the enormous demonstrations um, that Ma Mr. President Maduro was able to, to get together. They would only transmit uh, uh, Maria Corinas Machado's um, demonstrations, and they were creating this idea that the revolutionary forces would lose the elections. Then we went to the elections. They had witnesses in all the electoral booths. Um, we also had witnesses 
and during the day of the elections, they went to vote early. When I mean they, I mean those they call to to vote. Chavez was voting until the very end uh, uh, day, part of the day, and uh, we only have the result that we we could only have. Uh, this our system was considered the best electoral system. It's electronic. It's concentrated. It has all kind of. Um, it's very easy to audit from any perspective. You vote on the moment. You press the can the button for the candidate you prefer, and immediately you have your vote, and it's registered in the computer. Nonetheless, you still have um, uh, something that proves uh, and you keep in your hand the preference that you chose in this, in the, um, on the screen. So you have an extra evidence of what you voted. And when the um, electoral tables are closed, there are different uh, acts that are emitted and this is transmitted on real time to the tallies, uh, the uh, polling. And we compare more than half of the vote votings are compared with these acts. And there was no single denouncement that there was any kind of problems with this. Also, those tallies are signed by the uh, polling station presidents or chairs and, and each political party. Uh, the, the tallies are not published. Uh, they are under uh, guardianship of the National Electoral Council so that whenever a party or a candidate, candidate uh, would like to challenge the election, whether it was it is in the uh, Supreme Court or the National Electoral Council, you have the proof to um, to um, allow for that challenge. There is no single challenge of the latest election. That is false. Nor the parties, none of the opposition parties have presented a challenge uh of the results before the National Electoral Council. That has not happened. They have not even uh, attended uh, the, the office when they were called. They only, only candidate Gonzalez Urrutia and another candidates were missing when they were called upon. And when President Maduro decided to go to the electoral chamber of the Supreme Court and to and to start a review process of the whole electoral process to have an expert committee uh, check the elections, Mr. Gonzalez Urrutia was not in attendance. They are called upon for tomorrow as well. They say that they have proof of four. They have published 9,000 out of the 35 a uh, thousand uh, records approximately on a website that is quite irregular. There is no sign... Um, signatures of of the poll watchers. So this is, uh, this is not uh, correct. We all know that uh, such a website, or such such a um, a technique, can be um, tampered with. The tallies are not published. It's they are kept by the electoral council to to verify the results. This has not happened because in the face of this uh, reports of fraud by the opposition on that same Sunday night, and even though they have not presented a formal challenge before the authorities, the president requested the National Supreme Court to review the electoral process to call for the candidates for them to present their denouncements, their reports. Let's see what you are seeing on the media. Let's compare the your tallies with the real tallies. And after that uh, check-in, the Supreme Court will um, 
order the National Electoral Council to pronounce itself. And if it, there was an irregularity, then the Supreme Court would make uh, the decision it has to make. So what happened after the election, after this call for fraud? But, well, you have to know that, of course, we are in a polarized country, a country where the where the elections with such a turnout of almost 60% of the population. Uh, Chavism's um, baseline between 5 and 6 million voters who have been loyal to Chavism ever since 2010 or 2012 to date, we, we have kept this loyal base. We have an uh, like machinery, many processes in the field, and a government that has managed uh, its administration for the people to meet their needs, even though we are in amidst this hardship. An economy that has improved since 2021 very significantly, despite the imperialistic intervention. So if 12 people million people voted voted, and we have over six million um, people as a base of course Mr. Maduro has 52 percent of the vote Mr. Gonzalez Urrutia um, obtained 42 percent and the remaining six percent was obtained by the other nine candidates so if there had been um, a turnout of 14 million people, for example, well, you could argue, well, someone obtained 55 and the other one obtained 45% of the vote, but 70 versus 30, That's those are the figures that they say uh, through which Mr. Gonzalez Urrutia has won. This is statistically and demographically um impossible to prove any analyst could say that the 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 turnout of 60 percent of of the people would lead to this uh, result that the national electoral council has stated these these figures of 70 percent versus 30 percent is an insult to the intelligence of venezuelans and people in the world. Unfortunately, we see governments such as the United States government, who says Gonzalo Urrutia won the elections on one, on one day, then he said they say no, they are playing a game with the opposition, and we could not care less about this. This is what Mr. President said yesterday. The only thing that matters is what the Venezuelan people say, and, and the Supreme Court and the National Electoral Council issue as a sentence. Um, other countries not acknowledging the institutional process in Venezuela and not understanding that there will be that there was a previous review of the voting uh, we cannot care less we uh, tomorrow Mr. Gonzalo Surrutia is um, called by the Supreme Court and I don't think he will attend because they don't acknowledge this because they voted on a machine and they placed the vote on a ballot box and 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 even though they did all of this they did did not acknowledge the statement by the national Ele electoral council this is crazy but this is how they have behaved over the past year so to summarize from our point of view, the election was heroic. A people suffering an economic war, nationally, internationally blockade, uh, sanctions against PDVSA, our central bank, the national banking system, a media war, a psychological war, a diplomatic and political war, a conventional war, war as well with drones, attempts, of, of killing the president and green caps of the U.S. who entered our territory to kill the president, a lawfare as well against President Maduro. There, there is a New York 
district uh, accusing him of being a leader of um, Colombian uh, cartel. It's it's um, unbelievable, but this is what has happened. This is a people that has suffered scarcity of um, medicine, of food, um, inflation in 2017 and 2018, the, the highest rate in the world. Um, hospital input being in and missing there were no vaccine during the COVID-19 pandemic we were not able to purchase uh, Pfizer or AstraZeneca's or any laboratories vaccines and thank God with our international alliance with China and Russia we were able to do this and we ha were the least impacted country in Latin America by the pandemic a country where people have died who were not able to get to the hospital because of the lack of fuel or because there was a shutdown of electricity during a surgical operation or they could not find medicine for a serious illness that the government should offer and could not offer for the restrictions um, also a migratory or migration migration crisis even though we suffered all of this, we gave a victory to the Bolivarian Revolution and Mr. Maduro. This is historical. This is huge politically to acknowledge that Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution is a reality. It's a phenomenon, a political, social phenomenon in Venezuela. He has only protected its people and kept in power despite all the attempts nationally and internationally, to throw it out. Because we are the biggest oil reserve in the world. We are much more democratic than any other country in this hemisphere. We can compare ourselves with other countries and let's see who, who wins at democracy. We are the most democratic of the countries let's see what's the turnout in other countries how many presidential elections they have held in comparison to us and who are, are facing off at those elections because uh, uh, at a democratic if you have a democratic party and a conservative party uh, facing each other well what type of democracy is that we are uh comparing here socialism and neoliberal capitalism and this is what our people chose socialism so i want to share this information with you they have tried to to use guarimbas as we call them here a, a gangs armed gangs on the streets they attempted to try to throw this country into an internal conflicted country they're uh, 48 hours after that, it was all under control. We are in peace. Economy is much better than before the elections because there was a sort of tension of what was going to happen. But now people said, well, elections are over. Let's work. There is no uh, political disturbance uh, since t Tuesday or Wednesday last week despite the fact that the media and social media in general are saying otherwise. So we wanted to share that information. Yesterday, Mrs. Machado and Mr. Rutia said that they won and they call on military officers to carry out a coup against President Maduro to take on the presidency. That is so, so crazy. And this is what the United States has been acknowledging or the new Lima Group countries as well. The Venezuelan people decided, made a decision, the Bolivarian Revolution is still in power and we are walking towards prosperity and uh, a period to uh, make our Bolivarian Revolution so much deeper. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Jorge. Por... Thank you so much, Jorge, for being here. I, as I understand, you will not be here for the Q&A time, but we will have another guest. Uh, here for that. Uh, so I was thanking uh, Jorge Arraza, Executive Secretary of the ALBA, for, for his words and for appearing with us today. And 
Unfortunately, I don't think he's going to be able to stay for the Q&A, but we do have a special guest that, that for the Q&A that will be uh, taking his place. Up next, I'd like to invite Andreina Chavez to speak. Andreina was born in Maracaibo in the state of Zulia. She's based in Caracas since 2014. She joined Telesur as a writer and later became editor-in-chief. She currently works as a writer for Venezuela Analysis and is part of the Utopics Artists Collect Artist Collective, focusing on popular and feminist struggles. Uh, and in addition to working on to reporting on news for Venezuela Analysis, she's written some really excellent columns there that I urge you to check out. Welcome, Andreina. Hi, Sarane. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, well, I would like to start by saying that thank you for opening a space for talking about Venezuela and to talk about these. Uh, ongoing coup attempt that we are facing right now, which is something not new, something that we've been living for more than 25 years. And of course, this is another coup attempt that is being led by the extreme opposition with the support of the US government. So I think Jorge uh, Arreaza just gave such a wonderful exposition about uh, Venezuelan democracy, how Venezuelan democracy is not based only on these major electoral processes, but also just we have democracy on the ground every day uh, being carried out by popular organizations. So Venezuela democracy is actually much more complex and much more deep and robust than you can even imagine. And I'm sure that most of you who have uh, followed Venezuelan communities, Venezuelan popular power, you know about this. Um, so first of all, I would like to start by uh, maybe pointing out some of the things that you probably have been seen or reading in corporate media. So the things, all the lies that have been are being said about Venezuela versus what the reality on the ground. So I think most mainstream media outlets right now are pushing the narrative that the streets of Venezuela are on fire. You know, that that would have, I don't know, thousands of people protesting against the government, against the electoral results from July 28 that they are facing this uh, brutal repression from state security forces. And this, of course, is not true. What actually happened is that following the presidential election on July 28, we saw the opposition leader and U.S. asset Maria Corina Machado immediately reject the official results, the official electoral results that proclaimed President Maduro as the winner. And then immediately after she rejected this resource, which is something that we saw coming, because even before the elections, they already said that they were never going to accept whatever the National Electoral Council said, whatever the National Electoral Council published about the results. So Maria Corina rejected the results. And then immediately after, we saw these violent groups of people trying to create these, uh, these conditions for a repetition of the violent protest that we saw in 2014, that we saw in 2017, when more than 100 people died, uh, hoping for a coup to materialize. So this small group of people have, in the, pa in the past few days, they have carried out some really uh, horrifying fascist actions, such as the killing, the assassination of two Chavista women, two women who were popular leaders in their communities, they have also been burning, damaging, destroying universities, healthcare centers, schools, uh, buildings that belong to popular power organizations, buildings uh, that belong to the United Socialist Party, uh, statues of Hugo Chavez, and many more uh, fascist actions that we've been seeing lately. Uh, so these actions led to the arrest of uh, at least 2,000 people, most of them, have criminal records. Most of them have admitted that they will hire to destabilize the country, to create this violence. So we quickly saw how these quick detentions put an end to the violence that we were seeing in the streets. And we saw that the Venezuelan people in the majority, uh, they went back to normality. They went back to opening their businesses. They went back to uh, going to school, going to their jobs, and just, you know, just carrying out with their daily lives. So. This all indicates that this violence was really just something that, that was planified. It was something that was planified to, to create this a scenario of destabilization in the country to try to create the conditions for a coup. So that's something that I think it is really important to point out because uh, mainstream media is making you believe that these are just spontaneous demonstrations and the government is repressing them. And in reality, this is all part of one 
big agenda to create the conditions for regime change in Venezuela. But of course, there have been demonstrations from opposition supporters, that is true, mostly in the wealthy east side of Caracas. And these demonstrations, as far as I've been able to document, they have been uh, without incidents, they have been widely documented and propagandized by the international corporate media. Um, nonetheless, these outlets keep pushing the narrative that they are being repressed or that there's some sort of big instability in the country, which is not true. Ironically, what mainstream media is actually hiding from everybody is that there have been daily mobilizations by the Chavista, by Chavismo people. You know, ever since the elections in July 28, almost every single day, Chavismo has taken the street to defend the electoral results, to reject violence, to reject the coup attempt, to reject US interference, and to reject these new threats that we have about imposing more sanctions against the country. Uh, just this Saturday, there was a massive, a quite massive Chavismo march in Caracas. It, it was nationwide, but the biggest one was here in Caracas. And no corporate media reported about it because it doesn't fit the narrative that Venezuela is in, that of an entire country is supposedly being against the government. It doesn't fit that narrative. They don't care to show about people, about Chavista people, or the Venezuelan people in general. Uh, going to the streets, protesting peacefully to defend the electoral results, to defend the fact that uh, President Maduro was proclaimed the winner of the election. So I think this is the, the most important part that needs to be uh, understood right now. This is the reality on the ground in Venezuela. It, it is a country that is currently uh, in a peaceful moment after celebrating a very peaceful election. And, and people right now are simply waiting for the Venezuelan institutions to continue to investigate, to clarify, and to validate the electoral results from July 28. Um, I think this is one of the most important parts that needs to be said about. I think the second thing is about addressing all these lies and manipulations regarding the electoral results. I'm sure that everybody has heard about uh, the opposition saying that uh, there was fraud committed, and the fact that the National Electoral Council hasn't been able to publish the detailed results of the elections. And of course, there's a, a, a line of events that need to be need to be talked about. Uh, first of all, the National Electoral Council have given two reports, two bulletins, given the results of the elections. In both of these reports, they have proclaimed Maduro as the winner. In the second one, they said that he won by uh, almost 52% in comparison to Edmundo Gonzalez, who got 44%. And uh, this is actually very representative of Venezuelan reality, as Jorge Arreza was saying recently. Uh, this is actually quite representative of how the Venezuelan society is uh, more or less divided or pluralized at the moment, or always has been. So we saw this electoral, these two bulletins emitted by the National Electoral Council. And of course, they haven't published the detailed results. That is true. And the National Electoral Authority have said that they are in the mix of an ongoing hacking, hacking operation that has delayed this publication of the results in their websites, that has delayed many of the operations related to the transmission of the data. And the opposition, of course, has taken advantage of the situation to create this sort of parallel website where they have published uh, results of electoral, electoral tallies, voting records that have not been verified. And that is something that needs to be said a lot. They, have, they are publishing electoral tallies that have not been verified. In fact, President Nicolas Maduro went to the Supreme Court of Justice precisely because of these fraud claims. So the, electoral, so the Supreme Court can investigate if the electoral results given by the electoral authorities are actually leg legitimate. And I think that is, this is an incredible step to take because, I mean, this is something that the opposition should have done. If you have supposedly overwhelming evidence about your candidate winning an election, if you are completely sure that you have evidence that is absolutely legitimate, then you go to the competent institution to make these, to make these claims. So you can actually prove that you are right. 
Well, they haven't done that. It was President Maduro who actually went to the Supreme Court so they can clarify this, so they can clarify that he was the winner of the election. And the opposition, Edmundo Gonzalez and Maria Corina Machado and the political parties that represent them, they did not show up. They haven't said anything about even acknowledging this judicial investigation. And as far as we know, what they're trying to do right now is repeat this, is to create this second Juan Guaido type of interim government with Edmundo Gonzalez. And so far, we I don't think they're going to be successful in these in these plans because well, we already lived that. We already lived this Juan Guaido scenario. We already sort of know what to expect, what to do. And I don't think they're going to create really the momentum to be able to pull that off. But in any in any case, all this indicates that they do not they, they don't trust the evidence that they allegedly have. The only thing that they have right now is a parallel website where with unverified electoral tallies, and they do not care submitting this evidence to the Supreme Court because they know that they're going to file irregularities. They know that they're going to find that many of these electoral records are actually fake or they have been modified. And actually, just a superficial analysis that many people have done of these electoral uh, results that they published have already demonstrated that there are many irregularities. For example, many of these many of these voting records don't even have signatures of the witnesses in every in every station. They don't have uh, they they have so many. Some of them are incomplete, are damaged. Some of them don't even show up the voting for every single candidate. Some candidates don't even appear. So there's so many irregularities that you can already set you can already tell why they are not. Uh, going to the Supreme Court because they know that they don't they don't have uh, the evidence to support the claim that they are that are making that they won the election. So I think it's very important that uh, right now we understand that no matter what what is happening, no, no matter what is happening with the electoral results, which is that the Venezuelan institutions are solving this issue as Venezuela has always done, solving everything on its own with its own people, with its own institutions. The opposition is going to continue pushing with the, with the coup attempt. They don't care about the idea that the results are verified. They don't care about the idea that the Supreme Court is going to is trying to to make sure that every single candidate presents evidence and all the electoral tallies that they collected, so they can prove who actually won the election and they, they can prove the the result that the National Electoral Council gave. They don't care about any of that. They care about the coup attempt because they know that that's the only way they can actually reach power. So I think that is something that we need to uh, be aware of when it comes to corporate media and the lies that they're telling in Venezuela and what is actually happening on the ground right now. Thank you so much, Andreina. That was fantastic. Up next, uh, our final panelist, I'd like to introduce Alison Bodin. Alison is an anti-war climate justice and social justice activist and organizer with the fire, with uh, living in Vancouver, Canada, excuse me. She's on the editorial board of the Fire This Time newspaper and the author of the book Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Venezuela from Battle of Ideas Press. Allison was an international observer at the 2018 and 2024 presidential elections in Venezuela. And, you know, on a personal note, Allison, Allison is also one of the co-founders of the VSN, and she's been a leader and a reference point in the North American solidarity movement with Venezuela for many, many years. Welcome, Allison. Thank you, uh, Leo, for hosting today's webinar and to the Venezuela Solidarity Network, everyone that pulled together so quickly to make this urgent discussion happen. I'm really, of course, honored to be speaking with Jorge Arriaza and uh, with Edrina Chavez, uh, both Venezuelan voices that have contributed greatly to our post-election understanding of what happened in Venezuela, as well as our understanding of the Bolivarian revolutionary process over the past years. Uh, later, I think we'll share some more articles in the chat and everything. But uh, before I start, I will say that, you know, I see my you know, role on this panel of distinguished guests to really encourage people of the urgency to become involved in Venezuela solidarity. We have seen this onslaught of misinformation, disinformation, attacks on the Bolivarian revolution and democratically elected President Maduro increase, of course, in the past week. And that is a call to action for any of us living here, especially in North America, though I know and can see we have folks from Europe and across Latin America joining us as well. 
Really, it was being an honor to be part of Venezuela's 2024 presidential elections. On the ground, we experienced an uh, incredible program of education, an inspiring opportunity to visit and exchange with people in Venezuela, whether it was you know, hearing people speak and describing their electoral system on a stage in front of uh, the 900 electoral observers, or whether it was my own experience walking into a phone store wearing an electoral observer tag and having the person at the phone store explain to me that even though they were a simple phone store worker, they understood their electoral process and believed it to be the best in the entire world. And they wanted to convey that to me um, from their, what they called humble position as a single father in Venezuela. Those sort of beautiful experiences, uh, we can't exchange for anything. And the opportunity to travel to Venezuela and see it for ourselves is something that I'm sure all of the international observers would agree is an incredible honor. So over 900 international observers from one over 100 countries joined over 1,300 accredited journalists for the Venezuela presidential elections observation delegation. Through an educational program in the days leading up, we were able to learn in detail about how the electoral system and its robust system of audits functioned, and also uh, to exchange with one another about our experiences in talking with people on the streets of Venezuela leading up to the election. Many of us reflected, of course, on opportunities to be in Venezuela before 2019, 2018, and of course, those that were fortunate enough to be in Venezuela during the years of Comandante Hugo Chavez. We reflected upon how Venezuelans have continued their robust fight, their uh, ongoing struggle against criminal US-backed sanctions, over 900 punitive measures against the people of Venezuela, doing exactly what Jorge Arias has said, trying to strangle the Venezuelan people into submission, trying to prevent an election from being you know, able to be even held while at the same time saying there's no democracy in Venezuela. Um, you know, We reflected upon what we did see was economic recovery and that was a main message during the electoral campaign and the materials that we saw. Venezuela continues to fight back against these criminal sanctions but has really done so in a way uh, that is beginning to see um, a, economic growth unlike um, is being seen in other parts of Latin America. When it comes to the electoral system, the integrity and transparency of the system were shown throughout our entire experience. On the day of the election, the 900 observers were deployed to polling centers across, mostly Caracas, but not entirely, in order to observe the process. And we were also able to observe the materials that were distributed before the election. Of course, in any country, it's an important time for education during an election. To talk about your right and your duty to vote, and that is very much emphasized in Venezuela, where it's a simple system of walking around a circle of verified votes. Electronic and paper ballots has been described, but it's reiterated again and again because everyone needs to have access to vote. And I would say that that is Along with transparency and integrity, accessibility is something that is Venezuela's electoral system, and we never hear that in U.S. media. So I'm just going to share a few pictures for anyone that hasn't had the chance to see what it would look like in Venezuela uh, to uh, participate in the electoral campaign. I know people have a lot of questions and lots of folks have already been reading, and I would also like to emphasize and really thank every single observer or Venezuela solidarity activist that has taken the time to write an article, a tweet, post something on Instagram, alongside the tens of thousands of Venezuelans that are also activated to defend Venezuela. This has been an incredible response, I think, from the solidarity movement and something we need to build upon in all of our future work in solidarity with Venezuela. So leading up to the election, you can see this is a simple campaign table. Um, ones that were set up in thousands of places around Venezuela. This is, of course, for the PESU, but other political parties also had similar stations, encouraging people to vote and talking about the election. Very, you know, dare I say, uh, expected when it comes to an election campaign, except that it doesn't take uh, 
you know, millions and billions of dollars to run for president in Venezuela. These are some of the educational activities. This is us learning about Venezuela's electoral system from the experts. This is the uh, international companiers hearing from Diaz Battle Cabello, the vice president of the United Socialist Party, about the conditions leading up to the elections. And then we are in voting day. As I said, accessibility is a main message of Venezuela's electoral system. There is methods in place for people um, with disabilities to vote, of varying capacities to be assisted. There are um, very public lists posted outside of each voting center that are easy to check and people to assist if anyone has any questions. These are what the lineups may look like, everyone checking the list. This is early in the morning, actually very close to the hotel where we stayed. So an area that is would be considered more of a middle-class area of Caracas, you can see lines already. And I would say early in the day, uh, observers were very quick to begin reporting at the high voter turnout. We were not surprised at the nearly 60% voter turnout because all the stations we went to had lines throughout the morning, some people waiting up to five hours to vote. And it's a very efficient system. So it wasn't five hours because of inefficiency. It was five hours because of very long lineups. The mood of the day is tranquil throughout the entire day until we started getting reports at the end, which were touched on a bit that Venezuelans were attempting to vote because the one part of the Venezuelan voting system is that the polls stay open until the last person in line votes. So they open at 6 a.m., they technically close at 7, but if there's still people waiting in line, they'll stay open. And opposition far-right activists were attempting to close the polling stations early. That's not what's shown in this picture, though. What's shown in this picture is an audit taking place. There's people behind the fence that are the official witnesses that are watching the audit take place. Uh, and then there's people inside uh, or outside also looking in as the audit takes place. People are interested in what happened at their polling station and are welcoming the transparency that's present. This is just walking uh, down a random street in Caracas. And this is another version of that audit. So even in a voting center that you know, is a bit more high security, let's say, uh, because of the location where it happens to be, the audit is taking place inside and people are looking from the outside, curious about what's happening and feeling that their role uh, in Venezuela's election didn't stop when they went to the polls and voted. But throughout the whole day, this is walking around Caracas at about 8 p.m. at night. Um, you can see a sense of calm and there was a sense of celebration throughout the whole day as well. And this is just one small example, a photo of listening to a press conference a few days after the election, and you can see the person wearing the electoral observation vest. Now, I'm sure you've seen lots more pictures, but I would been, been amiss not to share any, so I thought I'd share a few. Uh, before I continue on, um, just to say that on top of this calm and celebration, um, Venezuelans know their electoral system very well, and it's well publicized and educated about, as I explained. You know, the ballot is shared, the information is shared beforehand. Because this was Venezuela's 32nd election in 25 years. And something that Venezuelans are very proud of is their air toy electrical system, electoral system, and also its constitutional backing. And that's something that the U.S. media completely misses. They dismiss entirely that Venezuela has a constitution and its Bolivarian revolutionary process, and that that has established how elections will go, what schedule they are based on, and what audits need to happen, and how the election is run through the CNE, the National Electoral Council, which we've already learned about today. It's as if the U.S. government dismisses entirely, or at least the U.S. media dismisses entirely, that Venezuela has any sort of constitution or civil society. And that's why going to see Venezuela for ourselves is so important. I also wanted to talk about mobilizing for the vote. When people say, oh, how did how could it be that so many people voted for Chavismo under such difficult conditions? The institutions of grassroots democracy within the Bolivarian revolutionary process were activated in a way that um, you can really feel when you walk through the streets of Caracas 
or when talking to people that visited nearby province uh, states, they could also feel. Because over 49,000 community councils, 5,200 militias, um, you know, mass movements across the country, uh, over 3,000, I believe 600 communes were activated towards the vote, towards uh, get, being involved in Venezuela's democratic presidential election. And this creates an energy um, that leads up to the actual voting day. Just briefly, I'll say that I visited La Vega, a working class neighborhood, which is well known for being well organized with community councils and multiple communes. And in La Vega, there were 63 voting centers just in this area, again, speaking towards the accessibility. I also visited El Valle, which is another working class neighborhood. And that's the neighborhood where lines were five to six hours long when we arrived at 12 noon. On July 28th, President Maduro won the presidential election and the people of Venezuela won with this election because they saw through the propaganda of the United States. And this has been, uh, you know, really carried forward also uh, through all the governments and people internationally that have recognized President Nicolas Maduro as winning the election. Once again, we're seeing graphs online that speak the truth about this uh, when they show what countries support the democratic election of President Nicolas Maduro. Um, and it doesn't include the US or Canada or the European Union. But when you look at a map, you see uh, it really includes the vast majority of the world, just not those countries, those imperialist countries. And another thing that struck me is the same thing that struck me in 2018 when Venezuela was and the people of Venezuela were really under the boot of U.S. sanctions. And that is that every time people voted in Venezuela, they voted for the President Maduro and for the Democratic and participated in their democratic process, knowing full well that every time they vote in President Maduro and vote to continue the Bolivarian revolutionary process, that it's going to create a deepening confrontation with imperialism, that sanctions will get more difficult, that the situation uh, could become more intense with US intervention and attacks. But people I talked to in voting lines understood this, they know it, but they voted in defense of their sovereignty and in defense of their self-determination and also voted in defense of the gains of the Bolivarian revolutionary process, uh, which we won't you know, talk in depth about today, but are important for us as people in the US and Canada to understand and know about. So while talking to people in lines in Venezuela, I was trying to imagine, and I ask all of you to imagine, could you still vote for someone and a government that's defending your sovereignty and independence, even knowing that the United States would continue to punish you if you do? And people of Venezuela once again said, yes, we will. Now a brief look, at media or you know the transcript of the call between US Secretary of State Anthony Blinken and Maria Corina Machado and Edmundo Gonzalez on August 2nd, 2024, would make us think that uh, there was fraud in the election, that Edmundo Gonzalez won, that it was clear. But the problem is that this was already predetermined by the US government. We could have read these articles two months ago because they were already saying there was gonna be fraud if President Maduro won. They already wrote their narrative and all they did on election day was put it into action. They put forward the narrative that Maduro couldn't possibly win. It wouldn't happen. Look at all of their polls, even though their polls are historically inaccurate or funded by the CIA. Now the far right in Venezuela has rejected the results, but everyone could have predicted that. They have no basis, they have no evidence yet again Yet the US media primarily is allowed to repeat this narrative again and again and have it repeated by other imperialist countries around the world. It's completely false cries about precinct level official results being withheld or uh, these falsified actas that we've already discussed or the tallies. Venezuela's electoral process is going through its process and should be allowed to do so without US um, intervention. But the framework of the world that the US puts forward continues to be that the United States is the arbiters of democracy along with our allies, including Canada or the European Union. 
when in fact the U.S. government and their allies do not care about democracy one bit or legitimate elections in Venezuela. Their main interest is overthrowing the government of Venezuela and reversing the gains of the Bolivarian revolutionary process, however they can do so. And in this light, once we've learned as we have from Adreina and from Jorge Ariasa, we can see that the U.S. allegations of fraud and the false claims of far-right opposition sound ridiculous. But there are serious consequences, and I don't want to forget that. Because when Maria Karina Machado gave the signal for violence to begin on the night following the election, that day violent gangs led by far-right thugs or just young people being paid $150 to take to the streets and target public institutions, community radios, and hospitals, people were activated. As international elections observers, we did not go outside. It was not the time uh, to be observing what was happening in the streets of Venezuela because the far right was moving and paying thugs to create and try and create uh, violent actions to overthrow the government of Venezuela. People of Venezuela immediately responded and fight back, but there were members of Venezuela's National Guard that were wounded, public institutions were damaged, and a Chavista leader, Isabel Cirilla Gil, in the state of Bolivar, was killed by right-wing thugs. What the U.S. government does to prop up these far-right actors in Venezuela has serious consequences and brings death and destruction to people in Venezuela as they try and foment instability. But really, the people responded. And over the past week, I haven't been in Venezuela during these, but many reporters from the US and Canada have been on the ground. They responded with mass mobilization, power in numbers, showing the power of Chavismo in the streets, and I really thank everyone that has been documenting that because Adarina is exactly right. It wasn't shown one bit in Western mass media. If it wasn't for voices on the ground reporting back, we wouldn't know about the mass mobilizations or the um, you know, doctoring of photos by the right wing. Everything that the Washington Post is relying on uh, is a silencing of Chavista voices and a silencing of the vast majority of people in Venezuela. So as I convey hopefully a bit of my experience and the, and the energy of the Venezuelan presidential election in 2024, what I wanna end on is to say that this has really redoubled our responsibility to share the truth about what is happening in Venezuela. And so many people have become active in this, but I think we have the necessity to build on this and build a more united and stronger solidarity movement, which is what we're working towards with the Venezuela Solidarity Network. And that means building a strong movement in defense of Venezuela's right to self-determination, in which I think we can bring many different other people and broad forces on board, including more of the over 900 international observers, which came from different organizations in Canada, the United States, and around the world. I think we can bring more people around supporting the right of Venezuelans to choose their own government as they have just done with this 2024 election. It's the Venezuelan Bolivarian Revolution and defending its independence has created a golden opportunity for progressive leftist, human loving activists to overcome fragmentation that existed has existed so long on the left. And I think we can unite around Venezuela and in defense of Venezuela against these US attacks. This is a movement that must involve people in the Latin American community, including uh, folks that are working hard, especially in the uh, Venezuelan community in the United States. This includes indigenous communities fighting for their own right to self-determination, whether here in Canada or in the United States. It means concrete actions, handing out information, petitioning, cultural events, bringing people from Venezuela to Canada or the United States, which uh, many of us could say, and I will tell you, has been nearly impossible, especially over the last few years, given the complete break in diplomatic relations between the countries, but is something that we should still work towards and strive through. Because people in Venezuela, led by democratically elected President Maduro, 
are extremely capable of dealing with all kinds of internal counter-revolutionary sabotage. And this has not been more clear than it has been uh, amplified over the last week. Imperialism is deeply threatened by the gains of the Bolivarian process. The more independent revolutionary Venezuela becomes, the more it threatens military domination and soft power strategic influence. And along with their, uh, and the US's attempt at hegemony over international markets and national resources throughout Latin America. Venezuela's independent government is a threat to imperialism because it is a source for poor, of inspiration for poor and working people in other countries who want to nationalize resources, redistribute land, organize their communities, and make sure basic human rights to food, water, housing, education, and health are provided to all. The strengthening of anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist movements across Latin America has created a huge fear and anxiety among imperialist governments. So for 24, 25 years, the US, Canada, Europe, these Lima Group countries, their right-wing allies in Latin America, have battered Venezuela with attempted coups, economic sabotage, criminal sanctions, violence, and outright violations of laws, constitution, and sovereignty of Venezuela, on top of constant threats of military intervention. And we can expect that this will continue, no matter how the U.S. presidential election ends up in a few months, or how under control the Bolivarian revolutionary process has um, successfully uh, controlled the right-wing violence in this current time. As people living in the US and Canada, we must stand beside people in Venezuela, and that means immediately increasing our efforts to explain to people in advanced imperialist countries about the impact of the over 900 sanctions on Venezuela and about uh, the impact of over 500 years of colonialism in Latin America. The most important way that we can help our, our compañeros and compañeras in Venezuela is by working here in the US and Canada or Europe to push these countries to drop all sanctions against Venezuela and end their campaign of aggression, sabotage, and threats of war. I'm calling on everyone here to redouble our efforts to build a movement in defense of the Venezuelan people, demanding US, Canada, hands off Venezuela, end the blockade against Venezuela, and respect the results of Venezuela's 2024 presidential election. I know folks have a lot of questions, but I really uh, thank you for your time. And uh, I'm sure we've got some announcements going in the chat. Thank you so much, Allison, and thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, I know that Jorge Argasa had to leave, but we do have a special guest for the q and I'd like to introduce Carlos Stron of the Simon Bolivar Institute, for peace and solidarity among peoples. And he's also the vice foreign minister for North American affairs uh, of the Venezuelan foreign ministry. Welcome, Carlos. And let me start off with a question for you. You know, the far right has attempted coups in the past. They've called for the armed forces to rise up. They've called for military interventions from abroad. They've called for more sanctions. None of this has worked. I mean, they've failed repeatedly at this for 22 years, if not longer. What, if anything, do they gain by continuing these failed strategies? Well, first of all, thank you uh, for the opportunity to join you as well. I think that, you know, uh, it's the constant um, attempt, at, at, again, making sure that you uh, overcome Venezuela's independence and Venezuela's sovereignty. I mean, there, there are two key issues that I think haunt uh, the Venezuelan uh, revolution, and it's that Venezuela sits on, on top of the largest uh, oil reserve in the world, and that Venezuela is an example for other countries to have a, an independent foreign policy, independent, uh, you know, uh, popular democracy. And those things continue to be, you know, uh, um, an obstacle for for you know corporate and 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 you know imperialist plans uh for the region so i think uh they'll continue you know to to attempt uh at regime change uh in whichever way they find possible uh the, you know the the more uh 
the logic of uh, capitalism, you know, fails to provide for, uh, you know, profit uh, uh, enlargement for, for these corporations, the more you're going to see, uh, you know, these attempts come back over and over again, even though uh, they fail over and over again. I mean, the fact that the involvement that you've seen in this particular um, attempt of uh, people like Elon Musk, you know, taking a particular uh, role, uh, you know, I don't know if if, if our, our, our audience has followed this, but, you know, there were, there's been constant tweets back and forth of Elon Musk, you know, attacking President Maduro directly. I mean, it's something that he engaged, which is not different from what happened uh, in the coup in 2019 against uh, um, President Morales in, in Bolivia. I mean, these are people that are now telling you, you know, we need these resources and we'll cool, you know, we'll, we'll start a coup against whoever we want. Uh, so I, I think I think it's a, you know, a reinstatement uh, of this policy of regime change for uh, for this particular interest. Thank you, Carlos. And, and here kind of maybe a more technical question that we got from one of the attendees regarding the detailed breakdown of the voting station results. You know, typically in Venezuela's as well as elections, we see the ENE publish this within a day or two of elections. Obviously, this has been delayed in part by the cyber attack. But now that we have this case in front of the Supreme Court, what do we How? I mean, is, it, is that something that we're going to have to wait for the case to be resolved before the, pub, the results are released publicly? Well, I, I believe, I mean, just, well, first of all, you know, it, it, it usually took about three or four days to get, you know, the, even the first results, depending on the complexity of, of the elections. That's important to say because, you know, there was this um, uh, initial notion that, uh, especially pushed forward by the Carter Center, you know, as if, you know, they the these, these results had to immediately be published. It's always been the first or you know first second bulletins and then as the days move forward you start you know putting all these information in overall the law stipulates you know article 155 of the law of um uh electoral processes in Venezuela states that there's a 30 day window where uh these uh, results have to be published so everything uh, i mean even even until now is still within the legal framework now as you mentioned it's important because having activated this recourse before the the Supreme Court, um, I, I believe that you know it, it would make sense that uh, first all the results that the CNE has provided to the court are first analyzed. Uh, also, uh, this whole week, uh, the different political parties that that uh, promoted the different candidates. Uh, you know, remind our, our, our audience that it's, it was ten candidates who ran in this election. So, so all the representatives for those from those political forces that um, uh, participated, they have been asked to also present, you know, whatever uh, uh, copies of the tally sheets or whatever, you know, whatever materials they may have in order to help uh, do an extensive. Um, an extensive uh, reading of, of of these results, so it, it it would seem more logical now to wait and rather than to generate anxiety or or, or you know uh, more tensions, you know, to wait for the process to uh, finish and you know do, do complete it. It's all uh, um, the, complete the whole process so that you could actually have uh, the published results. And I think. This might be for you or any of the our other panelists, but about these exit polls that were published on the day of the election, uh, published by the opposition and then cited widely by the United States that claim that President Maduro only received 30 percent of the vote. If someone could comment on those. I can offer some perspective. Um as we were in Venezuela uh, going to the polls, we started getting like social media being like, oh, there's exit polls, there's exit polls as observers. And the first thing that comes to our minds is we've learned and we know that exit polls are illegal in Venezuela. So this wasn't 
any sort of actual robust process where someone, you know, they did X amount of polls in X amount of neighborhoods and like came up with these good so-called good results. Like the biggest thing is where does this information come from? Who who asked the question? How did they ask it? Somehow I I just I would say that I, I think something really important to explain to people um, it takes a big shift in kind of our framework of thinking because like I said in the U.S. is considering that like we're the arbiter and the U.S. media in particular thinks they're the arbiter of what's a good election or not or what's a good poll or not and they can just say oh exit polls say this without anyone questioning what what's kind of exit poll who sponsored it aren't they illegal in Venezuela like what's the actual data we have to it's hard to work. It's like working against culture right now that's blasting people with fragmented pieces of information and decreasing people's critical thinking. But we have to be there. And a lot of people have been to say, wait, what are you doing? So I think that's the main thing is to say that they're they're illegal. Um, and uh, also to expose as, you know, the geopolitical economy report and Ben Norton and others have done, like, who is these, who are these pollsters? And um, why were these polls appearing also in the middle of the day when the election was still ongoing? It's all very irregular, it's manipulated, and a lot of it felt like it was coming from outside of Venezuela. Um, and I think people saw that, not only the observers, but also people uh, in Venezuela uh, saw that. And then I think we're only, only gonna take one last question because I've just realized we are at about maybe 20 minutes over time. Uh, What's the role that solidarity activists and particularly Venezuelans living abroad can play in supporting the people of Venezuela and encountering the opposition? This is for any of the three of you. So um, I'm not quite sure that I have like, a direct answer to that, but I, I, I've always said that the most important thing would be to try to uh, tell the truth about Venezuela anywhere you are, whether that is by uh, going to an interview, doing a panel like this one, writing an article, uh, talking with family, talking with friends. I think the most important battle that we have in Venezuela is so we're starting to demonstrate or prove the truth that we have here, the reality that we are living underground versus the reality that corporate media is trying to sell to the rest of the world. So that's one of the biggest battles that we have, the communicational battle. And that is something that we actually learned from Hugo Chavez from the beginning. He always told us that the first battle is the battle of the ideas. We first have to convince people of what is it that we are actually doing here, what the Bolivarian project is all about, what to have achieved with this Bolivarian project, what are, what are the socialist ideas that we have, and what is it that the U.S. sanctions and U.S. aggression in general have done to the Venezuelan society? Because up until today, there are still many people around the world, many corporate media outlets saying that U.S. sanctions are being imposed only against the Venezuelan government. And we all know by now that U.S. sanctions are being imposed against almost, the, almost all sectors of Venezuelan economy and that are affecting Venezuelan working class people across the country. So I think the best thing that you can do is always try to tell the truth about Venezuela and fight back against corporate media lies. Thank you so much, Andreina. I would also add that if you are a Venezuelan abroad, if you are in the in Canada or the United States, join the Venezuela Solidarity Group. I think we also have a sister network or sister organization in the UK. Uh, and if you're not in either of these three countries, you know, I think joining anti-imperialist movements in general is going to be positive uh, to help reduce some of this pressure on Venezuela. I know that I said that was the last question, but we just got one more in that I think is very important. Important. Carlos, could you talk a little bit about the connections between Zionism and Maria Corina Machado? Well, definitely, uh, there's there's important ties there. Uh, you know, first of all, you know, Maria Corina Machado has always been an outspoken uh, uh, Zionist. Uh, she has, um, in the different moments, uh, reached out to the Netanyahu uh, government and, you know, asked for support in, in condemning uh, President Maduro and condemning the Venezuelan government. At one point, her uh, political organization, Vente Venezuela, 
uh, also signed an agreement, I believe it was around 2021, if I'm not mistaken, where um, they signed an agreement where they actually said, you know, the, they about collaborating together when, you know, uh, with uh, Netanyahu's uh, Likud party. Uh, it's a collaboration agreement. And, you know, there's been numerous uh, opportunities uh, when she has come out uh, forcefully in defense of Israel, especially, you know, after October 7th, uh, in defense of Israel, of its integrity. Uh, she has promised that if she were to become president of Venezuela at some point, uh, the, you know, one of the first things she would do was reestablish uh, relations with Israel. But but not, but not only that, but to establish the Venezuelan embassy in Jerusalem, uh, you know, just taking it as far uh, as, as Zionism can take it. Uh, so I think it's important that we understand that what we're facing here in Venezuela, you know, it's not just a, an election. It's not just a difference of opinions of, of you know, political ideologies. And this is not this is not a normal situation in that sense. I mean, this is this is a, a true a confrontation between you know the uh, uh, the a revolutionary popular process that is confronting uh, international Zionism, international fascism. Uh, this is this is an, a, a, an arrangement uh, where all these forces are coupled together. The, the, the its economic interests, its political alignment, uh, its racist and 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 again fascist in all its sense of the word um uh, culture of 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 terrorism of 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 uh, um racism uh this is all this is all together uh as part of the attempt of destroying the bolivarian project and Bolivar bolivarian revolution so when we look at maria corina machado when we look at this political group we're not we're not only facing an opposition group in venezuela we're facing an international coalition uh, of uh, interest against uh, popular interest, not only in Venezuela, but in the rest of the world as well. Excellent. Thank you so much, Carlos. And with that, I think we're going to close this webinar. I'd like to thank once again, Jorge Arriaza, the Executive Secretary of ALBA, Andreina Chavez, Journalist of Venezuela Analysis, Alison Bodine, a member of the Venezuela Solidarity Network, and of course, Carlos Ron of the Institute, uh, Simon Bolivar Institute for Peace and Solidarity. And thank you also to our interpreters who've done a fantastic job and we're here longer than expected. And thank you for all everyone for joining us tonight. And you will be able to find a recording of this on YouTube within 24 hours, I believe. Thank you again, everyone.